Thank you so much for coming to our Focus on Faculty uh, again this, this year. We are pleased to invite a, a very distinguished faculty member today and we have um, a unique opportunity to hear from her about her research interest, her academic interests, but also some unique features a little bit more on the personal side and her more creative <laughs> adventures. I'm going to turn it over now to our Dean of Science and Math, Aaron Weiss, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Carla said, I'm Aaron Weiss, Dean of Science and Math, here to introduce Dr. Ruby Bile. Uh, Ruby has been at LCC since 2005 and is presently Professor of Environmental Science, Sustainable Agriculture and Sustainable Agriculture Coordinator, Service Learning Faculty Liaison. Wearing many hats, Dr. Bile is a champion for experiential education, campus sustainability, creating diverse educational experiences in the outdoor environment, not only for students, but also for members of the greater community. Dr. Bile earned her doctorate in environmental horticulture from, in 2007 from Cornell University. Uh, her PhD research there focused on the deposition of fine particulate pollution on leaf surfaces while her MS research, also at Cornell University, was on the phytoremediation of lead contaminated soils. Did I get that Very right? Very nice. Yeah, pretty good. Um, uh, beyond the classroom, songwriting and painting also fill her days. Uh, not surprisingly, <laughs> ecology is the primary subject of her song lyrics and artwork. Over the past 13 years, she has established on the college campus the LCC Specialty Gardens and founded the Sustainable Agriculture Program. Within the community, she likewise continues to cultivate the land through collaborative, regenerative projects inspired by nature. And on a personal note, I, I do have to say that Ruby is one of the uh, most passionate, uh, caring uh, individuals that I know. So without further ado, well, Dr. Ruby you. Bile. Thank so. you. Thank you very much. It is truly an honor to be here, to be invited as the Focus on Faculty presenter this year, and also to simply speak about the subject that I love the most. So I hope you will enjoy sharing this with me this time today. Um, the introductions have already been done, so <laughs> moving on. I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of my background. Uh, my outdoor experiences started from the very beginning of my childhood, as far back as I can remember. Spent a lot of time in trees with my uh, brother, uh, Jane, the other Dr. Bile, um, <laughs> Dr. James Bile, who teaches chemistry here, and my younger sister, uh, Susanna. Um, we grew up in a double lot in a small town with lots of overgrown trees and bushes to explore. And I feel uh, very lucky to have had that time in nature swimming in ponds and rivers in the rural and small town setting. Growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was a different time before technology, and we really spent all of our time outdoors. The Grapevines were our swings, and the bushes were our playhouses. And I have some very specific memories about these bushes in our yard. Um, my father, who's here today as well, uh, Fred Bile, he would uh, prune out the inside of the bush so that the dead limbs would you know, get out get out of the area and you could crawl in there and it was like a little hiding place. And here is uh, my mother, uh, Gwyneth, and my brother and myself hiding in the hydrangea bush. And the memory I have about the hydrangea in particular is the hollow stems. And the stems are so easily broken. So I'd break off the stems and I'd hollow the, out that, that wonderful substance, that pith in there. To me it seemed magical and I used to pretend that the more that I collected the more superpowers I could have, <laughs> that the pith of that hydrangea bush had some kind of magical power. And so I've uh, been starting to paint more recently, uh, really just this last year. I had a background in art in high school, but I moved into the sciences um, because of my passion for the environment. And also, as many people know, sometimes it's easier to make a living in science than in the arts. And uh, that was some good advice that I got from my father as well. Um, and so in uh, this particular painting, and maybe you've seen these displayed just outside the room for a 
closer look, um, I was thinking about these hiding places and crawling up on that rock and just being surrounded by nature. The uh, experiences that I've had, I have to thank my parents for. Again, I was very, very lucky that um, both of my parents were college educated. So I had understood from an early age the value of a college education. But in my younger years growing up, they earned a living through music playing bluegrass music. So it was amazing to have both parents around during the day and taking me on all these wonderful nature adventures. Um, maybe we'd have a babysitter at night, but on the other side of that, uh, being professional musicians, you don't necessarily make a lot of money. So I grew up pretty poor, and the benefit of that was that I learned from a very early age the value of experiences over things. And one memory I'd like to share with you uh, in particular was one Christmas, I remember, my parents had to purchase, I don't know if it was a washer and a dryer or a refrigerator, but some big appliances. And so we were very low on money for Christmas gifts. And of course, as a child, I didn't know all the ins and outs of that. But what I remember is we had two bedrooms for three kids, and the three of us had to stay in the one bedroom Christmas Eve. And so in my mind, I was imagining the other room when I woke up, it would be filled with holly hobby furniture and the fake, you know, um, the things, the easy bake ovens and the things that were around, like that was what was on my mind as a child. When we woke up and we went in that room, my uh, dad had constructed the coolest playhouse out of the empty cardboard boxes. He dismantled them and he put them up and he cut windows and doors and we played in that playhouse so many days and had so much fun and that was one of the best Christmases ever just from cardboard boxes. So it's again experiences um, more valuable than things and I really like to thank my parents for for having all those incredible experiences that shaped uh, who I am today. Uh, the other really big experience I had in nature was when I went to Ithaca, New York. Um, as you heard, I studied at Cornell University, which is a wonderful place to um, learn. But I also spent a lot of time just simply exploring the waterfalls. Lived there for about eight years, and there are still places that are adventurous. They're unexplored yet. There's just everywhere you turn. I walk out of my uh, apartment and I'm just in the middle of nature. This little um, gorge right here where the bridge is goes right up through the center of town. So literally you can walk from downtown Ithaca to the college campus in a nature trail and you don't even have to go through the city at all. So exploring these places uh, was so special to me, having that time there. And this was one of the paintings that I did inspired by those waterfalls called Mother Waterfall. I didn't put it on display because I want to redo it. I want to try to make the water look more watery as opposed to hair-like. But um, I'm getting there. So. Uh, Ithaca was really great and um, I did also have a chance to really learn and start to gauge my understanding of ecological services. So um, as um, Dr. Weiss mentioned, I did uh, the phytoremediation. I was looking at lead contaminated soils and how plants can pull that lead out of the soil and clean it up for us. In this case, we were looking at how trees can be the surface for deposition of fine particulate matter, which is one of those health hazards regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. So in my research there, um, we built this wind tunnel and we put in different types of plants and we measured the decay of the pollutant um, after going through this filter of vegetation. And it was a, a great experience, but it was a disappointing result. We found that the tree, and it kind of comes down to common sense, um, but all the literature at the time was saying plant more trees, 
have less particulate pollution, really the surface of the leaf is just a temporary place for that pollution to stay, and it can get resuspended re very easily. So um, that's what I learned, and I also learned um, from that experience that research can be very tedious and lonely. And so <laughs> I knew at that time that I wanted to be somewhere like the community college setting. I'm so thankful to be here at LCCC because it's exactly what I was looking for in terms of a teaching, a position that, that focuses on teaching as opposed to research. And I certainly do a lot of research with my students, but having my career every day being on the uh, ground with the students, helping people on a daily basis is certainly what is most fulfilling to me. This is my advisor, Dr. Tom Whitlow. He's the brains behind the construction of the wind tunnel. That was, um, I was just following his lead on that. Um, <laughs> this is a, a moment that I'm so glad to have captured um, with a photograph. Um, I got the job here. My brother had started teaching here a year before I applied for the position and I was still two years out on writing my dissertation for my PhD. So I was teaching and writing at the same time and I uh, was traveling back uh, to Cornell to defend and I stopped in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is where my parents lived where I grew up in my later teens and we were out in the woods um, behind my parents house and it was getting close to dusk and there was a little spotlight of sunshine coming down through the trees and uh, the butterflies were fluttering around and I was just standing there admiring them and sure enough they landed on me and I just felt like this was a sign of good luck and I needed it because uh, <laughs> I didn't <laughs> it was a struggle there for that defense but I got through it and um, so thankful for uh, my advisors helping me through that as well. So now the adventures with mom and I continue. Uh, my parents have set, since retired and moved out here to Illyria to be closer to my brother and I and it's so wonderful to have them here. So uh, mom and I uh, take adventures in nature as often as possible. I also love to share these experiences with the children in my life. And again, going back to the difference in the way the world is, you know, we see people in the virtual world constantly looking down at that cell phone. And so having the uh, opportunity to give the children in my life a uh, little bit of the same experience that I had growing up is really valuable to me. When I married uh, this man here, Eric Toth, I inherited three um, children, two of which are adult now, and two grandchildren. So this is Ryan, my stepson, and this is Ella and Everett, my uh, step-grandchildren. And uh, this place here, where you're seeing, this is under a weeping beech tree at Nature realm in uh, Summit County right there uh, outside of Akron which is where Eric is from and this is that same Weeping Beach so it's a place that we go as a family and you wouldn't notice if you're out in the Arboretum style park of Nature Realm you would not imagine getting under this tree and being in there but of course the people at Nature Realm must have had a childhood like me because they put in a little miniature chess set inside the tree which you would wouldn't discover unless you're a child playing or an adult child like myself um, that still likes to hide in the bushes and the trees. <laughs> this is a gorge in Erie, Pennsylvania, the Wintergreen Gorge. Um, of course, Ithaca has the most gorges and waterfalls of all the places I've visited, but that's a special place for me going back to Erie and my time spent there. Uh, Ryan is a special kid and we've shared uh, nature together. He's 13 now. I've known him since he's, he was three. Um, we've always enjoyed hiking together and we've always enjoyed doing art together. But it really was uh, February. We, ha we share the same birthday month. And so uh, February 2019 was when he started watching YouTube videos on the scrape painting technique. And we decided to invest in acrylic paints and canvases and just play around and see what happens. So these are two of the first paintings that he did and I did. Um, he, he didn't title this, but he described what he was painting to me, so I gave it a title, Birds Escaping Forest Fire. 
it's incredibly powerful image and I, we, I mean this is a huge problem we're hearing about the fires now still raging on obviously this was on his mind and being able to express it in such a beautiful and creative way I'm so proud of him uh, this was one of my first paintings and again I was just scraping and playing with the paint and it turned out to look like a birch in the winter storm so that's the title that it got all of the paintings that you see on display have all been within this uh, recent year. I've really been enjoying um, sharing uh, that with, with others. And um, as I post some paintings on Facebook, everybody encourages me to do a, a show. So I want to thank the library for allowing me to put those paintings out there as well. Always had that intimate connection to trees. Uh, going back to me climbing them. Uh, there, we're in another uh, weeping beach. This one's at the Sheffley Gardens over in Huron County. Uh, this is one of the paintings I did where I took a picture of the sycamore looking up uh, towards the sky and was able to um, paint that and I made the sky a lot more dramatic than it was in the picture um, and colorful just for fun. So thinking about trees, I also go back to my my always conscious of what nature does for us these ecological services that nature provides for us for free and one of those is trees and other plants make oxygen so this poem is so meaningful to me tree gather up my thoughts like the clouds in your branches draw up my soul like the waters in your roots in the arteries of your trunk bring me together through your leaves breathe out the sky <laughs> This poet obviously had some sense of that ecological service. It's such a wonderful thing. I think about uh, climate change, and people often hear the term carbon footprint now. It's, we think about our CO2, what we're emitting, what we're drying down. We know that plants absorb CO2 for the process of photosynthesis. But where does that CO2 go, and how is it stored? I particularly like this image from uh, the Tree Spirit Project, showing that the tree's leaves, we think of as being you know, the most prominent and beautiful part of the tree in a lot of cases, well, of course, they, in deciduous trees, they die back and fall back into the ground. So we can't forget the importance of the soil itself. And it's storing carbon for us in the tree roots, but also in that organic matter of the leaves falling and starting to decompose. And the tree also being a large specimen of life, having that carbon storage in its trunk and branches. I think about the other types of plants that we have. And this is a diagram from the EPA website that I think is so meaningful. If you look over here at this tiny, 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 tiny thing, that's uh, representing turf grass. The turf grass doesn't grow very tall, and the root systems are super tiny as well. In comparison to the plants of the Ohio native prairie or going out in some other western states, very similar type of prairie ecosystem, look at those root systems. Not only are they deep, but they're massive. They're storing carbon. They're creating soil that is full of life. They are drawing nutrients back up to the surface for other plants. They're keeping the storm water from going off the property and into the sewers and into Lake Erie and running off. So there's so many wonderful ecological services that the prairie is doing for us as well and I'm super proud to have a native prairie restored ecosystem here on our LCC campus. This is my favorite place to go in the outdoor environment. It's my also my largest living laboratory when I'm teaching my field science class. The native prairie is the place to be. Um, as you can see, it's simply gorgeous, so much biodiversity. Obviously, the soil ecosystem is important, but the pollinators love this place. You go into the native prairie, you sm everything smells different, everything sounds different. You've got birds flying overhead. Right now, it's starting to decline, obviously, as the cold winter's coming. You could go, you could collect some seeds for your own gardens if you like, but this is the time to be there late summer, early fall is when it's blooming and that's a perfect time for my class, my field science class. Um, another concept that I like to teach in a lot of my classes is the concept of biophilia. 
the love of life. This was a term uh, coined by E.O. Wilson in 1984. And I have my students, as they're in these outdoor environments, they're learning about the species diversity, they're taking soil samples, they're studying the soil, but they're also trying to connect with nature. And I think that's a really important lesson uh, to give them the opportunity to do a biophilia entry in their field journal every time we go outside. Uh, here are my students from this year. Um, these are some photos that Ron Jans took. He was joining us for a couple of our sessions. Um, and so again, we have uh, three labs that are dedicated into the prairie. And then as students decide to do what for their capstone projects, they may continue their research in this area. So we have a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite spots. I think it's one of the students' favorite spots as well. And I'd like to thank uh, Joan Perch for taking a large, and, and she's here today, hi Joan, for taking a big interest in our, our healing garden and uh, many of the gardens and natural areas that we have here on campus. This is a great example of one of the art-inspired projects from the prairie directly. Um, Danielle Squire, our specialty gardens coordinator, is with the students. They're collecting seeds, and they're using those seeds to make paper. So a very cool maker kind of project using the uh, prairie ecosystem. Um, if you remember, if any of you were here all the way back in 2009, we did pass a master landscape plan for the campus called uh, Campus in a Garden. And as I look at these pictures of the prairie ecosystem and how beautiful it is, and I look at this artist rendering, of what our front lawn could look like. It makes me um, excited that maybe someday <laughs> this vision will actually come to pass. Um, the folks who worked with us on our master landscape plan are from the collaborative incorporated in Toledo, and they're, they're the ones that did this artist rendering. So the idea is to have prairie plants around the landscape and rain gardens to absorb that runoff that we see sometimes a lot of standing water there. And I would imagine trails going through and winding through this area, and people could just kind of get lost in nature um, right there. Now, we do have uh, some contentious about this looking messy or not presentable or not within the public image that we want. So there might be a, a ways to go before that happens, but it's a dream of mine, and I'll keep that dream for as long as I teach here at the college. This plan, uh, going back to Cornell, when we were working with the collaborative, um, there was a committee at that time called the Greenscaping Committee. Um, Laura Carissimi started uh, the Green Campus Task Force, and some of the faculty and staff really got involved in that. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, Bob Flyer at the time, was very supportive of our plan. Um, and I brought some of the resources from Cornell Plantations. If you've maybe never heard of it, but it, it's, it's pretty world famous. They're the trails that go through the city itself, all through the college campus, it's incredibly extensive. And so when I went back to Cornell just uh, not last summer, but the summer before, I took some updated pictures. And I was really excited to see that they have stopped mowing a lot of the areas and started to allow things to look more natural and regrow. And again, just thinking about weaving our campus instead of just having a little isolated garden or a little natural area isolated here and there to have our campus in a garden, I truly hope to bring that landscape plan back and see uh, more of that vision come to life. I think about how all things are connected. My history, my childhood, my time at Cornell, the work here that I've done, and all the people that have shared in uh, collaborating on that work. I'll give a lot more examples as we go. But this is another one of the paintings that kind of sums that up. I uh, took a selfie you know, of myself, and that's that weird looking nose. You know, that's my, I realized how crooked my nose was when I started to paint that. Um, and then I tried to represent the water the earth and the sky and the energy from the sun and how all that is connected in the in the ecosystem. 
One of the best people to inform our uh, work here in sustainable agriculture, we call him the father of the land ethic. And I love this quote, um, simply caring about people, about land, and about strengthening the relationships between them. To view ourselves and the land as members of the same community and become caretakers of the earth. And I know that we have uh, talked a lot recently here at the college about the culture of caring. We care a lot about our students. We try to help them on many, many levels. And I think that if we extend that into the land and view ourselves of the, as that same community, that we will be much happier as people and we'll also be able to share more of those natural resources and ecological services with future generations, which is of course the core of sustainability. Another wonderful leader in our sustain, sustainable agriculture movement, um, the ultimate, I love his quote here, the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. And I think about that quote, I don't know if I believe in the perfect person. I, I obviously make mistakes. I try to be better every day. I strive for continuous improvement. But I don't think I'll ever be perfect. And I would never expect my students to be perfect. But I do think that there's a lot to be said in striving towards that goal and maybe a better word than perfect, perfection or perfect person would be self-actualized person. And this goes back again to a lot of what we see our students struggling with in this bottom tier, in the physical health tier. Just trying to be healthy, trying to work hard so that they have enough money to buy clothing and have a shelter and have food on the table. And a lot of our faculty and staff, I find myself in this tier the things of the day going through my head, uh, trying to get out of that headspace of just going from one thing to the other and never having a chance to breathe or rest or reflect. And obviously that's really, really important to our mental health, our emotional health, and our spiritual health. And so I think if we take some time to be in nature or maybe to do some of the other things that you enjoy doing, music, art, exercise, getting you out of that headspace of that daily stress of just the daily grind, so important. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, service learning, but I love to use this image as uh, I speak to my students about the benefits of service learning as well because look at this top tier beauty justice goodness desire to help others compassion we need more kindness in the world today to solve the problems I think that we're faced with that we often feel overwhelmed because they're so big they're so global they're constantly in our face on social media well let's step back a little bit and get give ourselves a dose of that good old-fashioned spiritual health we have a wonderful garden designed for this on campus, the Robert Calloway Memorial Healing Garden, which was inspired um, by the unfortunate passing of Dr. Calloway. Um, since then, we've, had, we've lost many members of our community, and we've used this space to honor them with prayer scrolls, with uh, memorial, memorials and dedication ceremonies. We've planted this garden with all medicinal and healing plant species. And I, of course, have to thank the original Healing Garden Collaborative. That's uh, Joan Perch, Patty Mack, Jen Kukas and myself there. Um, and then, of course, Laura uh, was a big part of that too, Laura Carissimi, um, and she's now retired. But it took a lot to get this garden going. We had uh, artists come in to design it, Donna Drozda. We had another artist, Frank Gearhart, do the beautiful granite sculptures that are now uh, part of our geology courses. It's a nice little spot to learn there. And then we also had um, Jim Gunlock do the benches, and he is now uh, working in marketing and doing a lot of great design work for the campus. So I invite you to check out the Healing Garden if you haven't seen that yet and get a little of that spiritual health that you deserve. 
We spent a good session there in Earth Day 2017 um, where we uh, did a little bit of, of gardening and learning about the plants and we had another um, a wonderful little ceremony there. So just uh, some more great pictures from that event. And we've got Ray in there as well. <laughs> Um, Joan shared these photos with me. Um, as you know, the Campiana Center is an awesome place to bring together science, technology, art, engineering, and math. The STEAM teens have a wonderful opportunity to integrate those those um, disciplines into making and, and creativity and utilizing the technology there, but also just getting out into the garden and doing some sketching and going f to nature for that initial inspiration. I use this publication in my classes. Um, I can talk on and on about my personal experiences and the benefits on an emotional level, but there's a lot of science behind it as well. And this is a great review publication. I've just given you sort of the outline, but there's a lot of different actual um, issues um, that are documented in uh, being uh, helped through gardening and food growing. Social and therapeutic horticulture, mental health and well-being, certainly things associated with diet like obesity, healthy weight management and eating. And then of course nature is not going to cure diseases like cancer or chronic illnesses like allergies or, or asthma, but People can use nature and that spiritual connection to help cope with those diseases. And that can be really important, obviously, for people that are being treated and in recovery, and for their families as well, to have that kind of spiritual connection and that mechanism of coping. Um, going back to Cornell, um, they do a lot with this. And again, getting a lot of ideas from my alma mater. Um, here's another website for um, some of the documented uh, garden-based benefits that Cornell has been working on as well. And if anybody wants a copy of this presentation, I'm more than happy to share, uh, share that with you. We also have a lot of this garden-based education happening right here at LC. Another thing that I'm super proud of, uh, Michelle Hennis is really the uh, woman to take the credit. All I can say is that I had my ecology students in the very beginning plant the sensory garden. So the sensory garden, uh, this little plot to the side of the early ch childhood center was just rock and weeds. And I had three groups of students uh, working together to remove that river rock, to purchase and select the plants, to plant the plants, to till up the soil, to get everything ready. And that garden inspired in Michelle and her staff an idea to make gardening the education center every summer for those kids. So again, thinking about that next generation and giving kids the experience of being in nature and having a chance to get their hands dirty and smell the smell of the soil and see where those fruits and vegetables come from and maybe it's not so bad to try it and eat it. Um, they work with culinary arts. They'll come and harvest and actually make uh, pesto or salsa with the kids. So it's a wonderful thing that Michelle and her staff has done. Um, they are uh, applying for grants all the time to improve uh, this space and the, and the learning opportunities that come there. Just last Friday, I went to Bellwether Farm for the first time. This is um, part of my Introduction to Sustainable Agriculture course where every week we visit a new farm or garden type business or sometimes it's a nonprofit organization. Bellwether Farm is associated with the Episcopal Diocese of Ohio and they raised through donations $17 million to start this farm in Wakeman, Ohio. And I was blown away. They do summer camps. They have retreats for uh, conferences, for any kind of group that uh, would want to go there and benefit from the health and well-being of being on the farm. And I talk a lot about plants, again, horticulture being my background, but just visiting with the animals. You know, Friday, right? You're tired. It's a long day. Um, this is at the end of the day, in the afternoon. Every Friday I'm tired, but once I got to this farm, my energy level 
level, changed immediately, my mood immediately changed. I made friends with this goat, Lucy. <laughs> she is really, really friendly. And uh, we visited with the chickens. They were lamb, there were sheep and goats together. The uh, sheep dogs were very, very friendly. And then we even got to see uh, these uh, pigs feeding. And boy, they were fun, uh, very entertaining to watch. So these are the kinds of um, experiences that you could have at Bellwether. Again, anyone can uh, book a room. It's very reasonably priced. The um, rooms do not have a television set. So be prepared to have nature uh, be your entertainment if you decide to go to Bellwether. So the program, right? So I've, I've tried to do more with marketing and trying to integrate some of my art into this. I painted this painting called Cultivating People and thinking about that quote and putting some of that on uh, there. I've decided to switch out my business cards with the little painting <laughs> to help promote the program. So if anyone wants to pick one of these up and learn more about the Sustainable Agriculture Program, I'm your gal. Contact me. I'd love to answer your questions about that. Um, we do need more young people um, non-traditional students, anybody is welcome uh, to join the program and I know that some of our students are here today so thank you for your support. I want to give you a couple great success stories from our sustainable ag program. The first one, Jim Goforth. Uh, Jim's going to be in the Opportunity Magazine coming up in a couple months. Uh, Jim's story is incredible. He's a recovering addict and he will tell you that farming saved his life. He got our specialty crop grower certificate, which is just a uh, six, um, sorry, a two semester um, commitment. And through that uh, certificate, he was able to start his own business called Gateway Farms. He now has two farm plots, one urban in his backyard, and he's collaborating with others to uh, have land on their farm to work. He goes to market, and he's just such an inspiration to our new students. So I'm super proud of Jim, and I'm really glad uh, to have him um, to represent uh, some of the dramatic effects and impacts that uh, sustainable agriculture can bring to your life. He's just doing an amazing thing. Um, he puts cut flowers in to make the gardens look nicer um, and he also sells bouquets at the market and this here is the compost tea that he's making. So when you think about that soil health, the main thing that we're shifting to is we always used to do chemistry, chemistry tests. Now we're really focusing on biology and whatever we do to the soil in sustainable agriculture is to promote those beneficial microorganisms. So one of the ways to do that is to take your waste material from your garden or from your kitchen and put it in, in uh, a big vat and let it ferment and pour it on your garden. That's the compost tea uh, method. Another success story, Jeanette Simcoe. She already she came to our program. She already had a background in higher education. She completed our certificate. She got some experience in the field, and now she's teaching for us. She's one of our best instructors. She teaches crop production and plant propagation. This is our home away from home. This is Second Spring Farm in Grafton, Ohio. This is the site for our crop production classes. We have summer, spring, and fall crop production so our students can have a whole year of experience throughout the growing season at that farm site. Um, so they are making a little student snack plot here um, where the sign is and the students love to snack on the fresh uh, produce as they're working away. Farming is hard work, and so this is one of our classes to really sort of test, you know, how much work, how dirty can you get, <laughs> how, how hard are you willing to work, and physically, um, and it always uh, helps to uh, have more hands on hand to do big projects like putting down row covers or, you know, larger irrigation kind of systems. Here they are at one of the alpaca farms nearby, our little world alpaca is one of our community partners. Alpaca droppings make perfect fertilizer because they don't need to be compost.
compost it. There's no pathogens in there. So you can just take the alpaca pellets and throw it right on your garden without any worries. So we're always looking, of course, for those organic alternatives um, in our sustainable ag program. The third success story I want to share is our very own Danielle Squire. She's our specialty gardens coordinator. She's had that role for the past three years. Um, we had some struggles with the specialty gardens. They were planted, but there was no plan on who would maintain them. There was a lot of transitioning in the physical plant, so sometimes we had help, sometimes we didn't. Uh, Danielle worked so hard in making these gardens beautiful, and as a student in sustainable agriculture, she is the perfect person to apply those um, key principles and techniques that we are, are showing our students. So I invite you to uh, volunteer with Danielle and get some of that nature therapy and contribute a little bit back to the gardens if you'd like. We also have some great other subjects in the sustainable agriculture program from a uh, couple of experts. Uh, Sherry Heffernan is a business owner and she does a lot with interior landscape so she teaches a lot in the field of biophilic design where if you can't get outside what's the next best thing? Let's bring nature indoors. So there's a big movement now in architecture to bring those elements of nature into the indoor environment and allow us to appreciate that as well. In permaculture design, this is our expert, Brett, Dr. Brett Joseph. He's also a former coordinator of the program, and he now works on a lot of special projects for us. So he um, has a background in law and just so many uh, wonderful things that he brings to the table. I met him at one of the biomimicry meetings, and we've just gotten along so well. Um, I wanted to offer permaculture design in, as part of our program, and he was the perfect person uh, to do that. So um, I'm honored to be here speaking to you, but as you can see, there are so many others that are involved in this wonderful work. Permaculture design uh, is part of our Associate of Applied Science program, but it's also a standalone certificate. And it's only six credits. It's an internationally recognized certificate. If you are doing something that is similar, um, this could be a leg up in terms of your professional credentials. So speaking of our program and some of the classes that we offered, I just got approved at Curriculum Council a couple weeks ago. We're going to bring our most popular course, Wild Edibles, out not just in the spring, but in the summer and fall semesters as well. Obviously, different things are edible at different times of year. And uh, this course is um, a fun one for uh, students it's just one credit you don't have to be a sustainable agriculture major to take any of our courses um, this one is five uh, weeks it's a saturday five saturdays for one credit go on field trips you learn how to ethically and sustainably forage what's edible how to prepare these edibles um, this is a painting that i did called pokeweed canopy um, looking at, at a photograph i took in my mom and dad's backyard yard, um, you wouldn't want to eat this plant at this stage. It's incredibly poisonous. But, <laughs> but <laughs> when the poke is coming out of the ground at a very young age, before the shoots start to hollow out, it's a tender edible. It still has to be boiled twice to get out any potential toxins, but it's one of my favorite edibles, and this is one of the valuable things that I actually learned as a child, um, harvesting those wild edibles with my parents and eating these unusual things that probably no one else um, at that age <laughs> would have thought of trying. <clears throat> this one, Dandelion Secrets. So <laughs> on this one, when I was painting it, I was thinking about the hidden values of the dandelion and how often it is revered as a villain of the highly manicured lawn landscape. But the dandelion is one of my favorite 
plants. I love the look, I love the smell. It's edible, it's medicinal. All parts of the plant are edible at all stages of life. You don't ever have to worry about being poisoned by a dandelion. It's great for pollinators. It loosens compacted soil, which we have a lot here on the campus. And the taproot of the dandelion is another one of those plants like the prairie plants that's going to pull your nutrients back up as it leaches down with gravity and water. Plants that, companion plants like dandelions that pull that back up to the surface are great for the other plants that you might be trying to grow, um, say, in your garden. So the dandelion is not the villain. And if I had one wish to uh, put out there to the LCCC community, it would be let's stop spraying lawn chemicals. Let's, let's favor some dandelions and some clovers instead because they're beautiful and we don't need to be poisoning our landscape any more than <laughs> we already have to deal with the poisons in our environment already. So dandelion secrets, and look at them. I mean, they <laughs> I think there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes there. <laughs> Um, so another concept I just want to put out there is, is the uh, key word biomimicry. This is a d another design type uh, discipline. It's not anything new to look at nature and see what we can learn from nature. But the design discipline has been recently um, put out there by a woman, her name's Janine, Janine Benyus, uh, has coined the term and really brought it into effect in terms of a whole uh, professional discipline. I like it because it's collaborative. It brings together, together the biologists who are understanding the biology behind the scenes, the designers, the engineers. Um, the business people who are looking at nature to create money-making solutions that are also going to um, be beneficial to, to human society and the future as well. So I did my sabbatical on this topic and I went to a lot of meetings, I did more research. The whole goal was to put more biomimicry lessons into my courses. Um, but the biggest takeaway from all of that was get outside more. And so that's what I have strived to, to do in my courses as well. When I think about the tree and I think about what we can learn from absor ob observing and understanding the tree, this is the perfect poem to express that. Soak up the sun, affirm life's magic, be graceful in the wind, stand tall after a storm, feel refreshed after it rains, grow strong without notice, be prepared for each season, provide shelter to strangers, hang tough through a cold spell, emerge renewed at the first sign of spring, stay deeply rooted while reaching for the sky, be still long enough to hear your own leaves rustling. I love that last line because again, when I get in that headspace and I'm going through all my tasks, running from this place to that place, checking things off my list, I have to remind myself to be still and to listen to my heart and what I need to find that right balance in life so that I'm not a workaholic maniac perfectionist and I still have those wonderful things that lead to that emotional and spiritual health that we all need. I took a survey um, from my students and the results are all over the place as you might expect, but I wanted to point out this highest um, achievement where the students most completely agreed and had the, little, the lowest variability around the mean appreciation of the natural world. So that was a win for me just to get um, a, a good result in that particular category. I also use the concept of biomimicry when I'm introducing the concept of service learning to my students. Um, most of you are familiar with this concept, probably some of you teach with it, but the idea is that the student does community service, benefiting the community, and also that service is somehow related to the learning outcomes in their course. And so I look at 
the species interactions in nature, we call them a mutual symbiosis when both species, or sometimes it's three or four at once, are all mutually benefiting. This is one of the most important ones in agriculture. Instead of applying chemical fertilizers, farmers can plant legumes. Legumes like soy, beans, peas, clover in this case, have a relationship with bacteria in the soil. This particular type of bacteria has the ability to take nitrogen, we have our atmosphere that's composed mostly of nitrogen, but that's unavailable to plant roots. So the bacteria can harness that nitrogen, fix it into the soil right where the plant roots need it. And if you do something even just as simple as a crop rotation, you can avoid using uh, as much of that uh, chemical fertilizer that um, you're probably aware will run off if it's not all used at the right time, runs off into the waterways and starts to lead to algae blooms. That's probably the biggest water quality issue in the Great Lakes right now. Algae blooms, um, dead zones, and when we unfortunately get something like toxic algae that shut down the whole Toledo water supply a few years back. So really just again seeing how these connections are made and showing the students that when you give back to the community you're going to receive all of these benefits in return and so this is from one of the uh, wonderful documents that uh, Marcia Jones and uh, the other folks in career services that are so involved in service learning this is one of the great resources that they shared with me the gift of giving increased self-efficacy motivate students to become lifelong learners, replace biases with accurate information, right? A lot of us are afraid of people or things that we don't know or that are unfamiliar to us. So if we go out and have those experiences, we can get rid of those biases. Develop a sense of community and global responsibility. And so again, uh, have to put in my plug for service learning, of course. It's a wonderful technique. So I invite you to visit those gardens. The Hummingbird Habitat Butterfly Garden is the first one that was ever created here on campus, again through my ecology service learning students, and since then has been a place for lots of other projects. We've worked with the Rosie's Girls, with uh, Ramona Anand, and uh, Brenda Owens in early college high school has done a lot with the gardens and her service learning students. And of course, um, Danielle Squire continues continues to work hard in these spaces and volunteers are always welcome. So there's a lot of wonderful things to do outdoors here on campus. Even as the weather gets cold, just getting outside for some fresh air and some sunshine can really help. Um, we also worked with Katherine Orntek in Health and Wellness to create a walking map that will take you through the gardens, so you can find that on their website. Uh, the farmer's market uh, this year was outdoors, and even if it's indoors, I mean, either way, uh, check it out. We've got a lot of great local farmers to highlight there. Um, the gardens, and then there's two other natural spaces that I would like everyone to be aware of. The Flora Interpretive Trail was first um, uh, established all the way back in 1999 with a partnership agreement with former President Church and uh, Jack Smith of the Black River Audubon Society. And so I do have some of my Audubon uh, friends here as well. Um, this is one of our best community partners, not only in birding but in conservation subjects as well. The Flora Interpretive Trail is wonderful because it's labeled and you can go and check out the little booklets and you can find and the, uh, the folks come and they put the signs and, and they do a lot of work to keep it current. So it's a very short stretch, but it's a perfect spot to get out there and surrounded by a forest ecosystem and learn some of the plants. I would recommend going there in early spring because that's when the spring uh, wildflowers are going to be popping up. Things like mayapple and jack in the pulpit, um, wild geranium. The other space I'm very proud of here is another Audubon space. Again, I wouldn't call these the gardens because they're really more natural areas. The Meadow Preserve, this is dedicated really 
as a habitat for nesting birds. And um, so pleased that Dr. Ballinger is continuing that partnership. Uh, she dedicated and increased the space to 23 acres at our ceremony in Earth Day back in 2018. Um, Dr. Harriet Alger is a wonderful uh, partner in this. She's um, constantly keeping up uh, with that partnership and working on the signs and making sure that everybody's doing their part and she's just amazing. She's I think 91 years old now and she has so many great stories to share with the students and I love uh, working with her so much. So um, if you have students that cannot seem to get rid of that cell phone, <laughs> there are a lot of ways to connect with nature um, and using modern day technology as well. And so I couldn't um, finish the talk without at least mentioning citizen science. I do a lot of this in my field science class. Um, there's a lot of ways to observe nature, to take pictures, to get with a global community of people that are also looking at those pictures and helping you identify those species. Um, some of the most interesting ones are the nature's notebook that we use in the garden. This is about phenology. So as we think long term, we can see with climate change and with even just different weather patterns and different seasons, well, the colors, the fall colors are extremely bright this year. And what time did they start to change? And when did you first see the bloom on that particular plant in the garden? So we can track things long term using the nature's notebook. iNaturalist is a great one to get started on. You just snap your picture, you upload it to the app. You don't have to know what you're looking at because there's a whole global community out there that are sharing that uh, picture and and information about it. So um, these are very specific sites, but if you're interested in citizen science, it doesn't have to be outdoors. Um, the SciStarter and the Scientific American have hundreds of citizen science projects out there, so I encourage you to explore um, that as you may. I'm going to end my uh, talk here by coming back to the subject of soil. Um, obviously, there's some very clear environmental health impacts and, of course, being connected to our environment that influences our human health as well. But there's also a new discovery in the human health directly. Uh, soil bacteria has been found and it's starting to be studied as it is able to uh, release serotonin in the brain of mice so far, they've tested. Um, and they've also looked at cancer patients who are interacting with soil. You smell that smell, your hands are in the dirt, it's a calming kind of feeling. I think there's a direct connection there with that feel-good hormone, serotonin. And so I also have to point out the economic value of soil. We often think about the environment and the economy as being at odds, but if you consider econo ecological services that they do for us for free, and you start to think, how could we put a dollar value on that, and I do this exercise with my students in my ecology class, this table comes all the way back from the 1997 publication in the, in the journal Nature. Soil formation is worth $17 trillion a year. And if you think about how soil can easily wash away, if you've got a bare ground and there's a big storm and you lose a whole inch of soil, well, soil formation, you can get about a millimeter of soil per year. And so it's a long process through chemical and biological influences to get that soil back. It's extremely valuable to us. And so I'm going to uh, end my talk by sharing with you my song called Soil. As you see the lyrics there, you can see that a lot of those ecological services and concepts that I've talked about are embedded into the lyrics. By the way, this is my little band, my little rock band called the Sibs. Mom came up with the name. Sibs is short for siblings. Started out with just me and my bro. My husband came along, now he plays guitar, and so now we're totally complete as the Sibs. <clears throat> okay. 
soil, 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 soil. There's something about you, oh, soil, 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 soil. Something about you, you plaster my brain with a rush of serotonin. The microbes inside you that make you breathe, they make me feel so free. In light of the fact, your 20 trillion dollar impact, you're the basic ecosystem making food for me, my soil, 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 something about you, yes, yeah, soil. The soil, the soil, soil. Something about you with fun, guy that spread tiny threads beneath the surface, secreting enzymes, decompose, brings new life from the dead in light of the fact your 20 trillion dollar impact you're the basic ecosystem making food for me my soil 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 something about you oh soil 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 we can't live without you thank you thank you thank you so much so Take the long way home sometimes. Enjoy a little nature. Get a little spiritual health. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. I guess if there are any questions, I could take questions. Yeah, Jim. You mentioned a 23 acres of meadow that was recently experienced. Where is that located? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, if I go back. Um, oh, he said the, tw the 23 acres of meadow. Where is that located exactly? And I can go back to this map. It's all the way up here at the north side of the campus. So you would probably see it from a distance seeing the wind turbines. The wind turbines are uh, not active at the moment. They're for a demonstration. I know there's some uh, controversy about wind power and bird migration. So we wouldn't want to have those wind turbines where the birds would get killed. <laughs> but they are there. Um, and that's the, the nesting habitat. And one of the other things that I'm so proud that Physical Plant is doing, I'm glad you asked that question because I forgot to mention it earlier, they are starting to not mow. And you've probably noticed that there's a lot of little wild spaces popping up. So hopefully this talk will help everyone see the value of those no mow areas and let's encourage more of that uh, where it's appropriate here on campus. Um, yes, thank you for that. One more question? Is that area um, off-limits given that it's a preserve or no. are there paths? Or? The uh, trail goes, he's asking if the area is off-limits since it's, it's a preserve. It's a conservation area. Uh, everyone is invited to walk around. You would not generally go into the nesting habitat there's no trails to go in but there's a really nice trail all the way around and i do believe maybe some of the long distance runners might take that trail i know some of the birders come and and use the area and you'll see um, the sign uh, there as well you'll see the sign there uh, as well to show you what birds you can can look for thank you for the question joan so if we all went into the fairy garden now and got through those seeds and just started walking around, we'd make a jump? 
<laughs> Joan's asking if we uh, went to the native prairie and took some seeds and just started dropping them around, could she make my dream come true? Um, not if the campus still keeps spraying lawn chemicals. Um, so, but you can get those seeds and you can do what they call guerrilla gardening. You can throw them in the ditches along the roadside um, and we can see what, what happens. Yeah. Yeah, anybody's welcome to harvest seeds from the prairie. It's so abundant there. Um, we have the milkweed. So, yeah. Right, yeah. And sometimes, so she's saying, what are seeds, what are not? Um, sometimes you look at the little seed heads and you can see the remnant of the flower, but then when you look closely, it's just sort of a papery covering and all the seeds have actually gone out. And if you're collecting uh, common milkweed, which of course is the primary food source for the monarch butterfly, you want to make sure you get the seeds at the right time. When the pods are green, it's too early. You want to make sure that they're brown and starting to dry. So yeah, there's a little little bit of knowledge behind it, but it wouldn't hurt to grab a handful of something and just toss it and see what happened. But if anybody wants to come out into the prairie with me and have that uh, more in-depth educational experience, I'd be happy to go with you. Also, um, take my field science class, Biology 164. And um, Danielle Squire uh, is very knowledgeable about the plants out there as well. She could be a good source for you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, Jennifer. I couldn't quite hear you. Oh, that was at the end too. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can send those to you. I can send you a copy of the PowerPoint. This PowerPoint with all the pictures is like 40 megabytes. It's a, the biggest file that I've ever created. Um, but I could put it in a PDF, you know, and, and bring the size down and send it to anyone who wants it. So just come and get my card or... Um, if you're okay, we can actually add them to our LibGuide about the event that has your bio. Sure. Like that if you We'll put it on the, the web, the library website, and anybody can get in contact with me. Just take my, my card. Um, I'd be happy to share those with you. Yeah, they're really, there's just so amazing ones. Like um, I, in the Biology 151, the general biology class that I, I just teach occasionally, one of the more popular ones is, um, it's called Stall Catchers, and they have all of these videos of blood vessels in Alzheimer's patients. And the students are, uh, the, the project is for the student because a human brain is still better than a computer at recognizing certain things. And so they look through those images and they report how many times the blood flow is stalled at those blood vessels and it helps in Alzheimer's research. So, I mean, it goes way beyond the natural world and into all, all sorts of science areas. And there's probably social science projects in there too. I imagine there's a ton for, you know, almost any faculty that wants to get students doing um, a, a part of a global community collecting data. Yeah. Yeah, Kathy. Um, with your citizen science links, <clears throat> I'm surprised you didn't have the Cornell Lab of Oh, yeah. Um, Fever Watch. Right. Angie and I do that here on campus every year. All you do is look out your window for two days a week and report what birds come. And if you can't do it, they don't care. And if you go on vacation, they don't yeah. care. It's a wonderful opportunity, and it's, you don't have to be outside. But that's true. Yeah, right outside the window. That's a great one. Um, did you want to address that? I just wanted to add, with the 20 bluebird boxes that are on the campus property, that is also supplementing citizen science through Cornell, because we enter the data from every nesting of every box all through the spring and summer. So Cornell is getting some benefit from the boxes and the data that's collected through those. Yeah, that's great. Um, for the video folks watching <laughs> the video, um, Kathy's uh, saying that the uh, or C Cornell has a great citizen science, and you're right, I should have mentioned that. Um, the reason I don't use it in my class is because it is such a short term experience and you're just looking every now and then and um, but it's so valuable for the the greater uh, good and the projects and then um, 
mentioning those bluebird boxes around, that's a, a, a wonderful um, project that uh, Peggy and Fritz are are doing. Um, and so we, yeah, we do have a lot of opportunity for um, the, the bluebird, so people that might want to volunteer with that, and also the data that the Audubon Society is collecting locally is going, they're very directly connected to the Cornell uh, work as well. So yeah, if you're interested in birds, we can do a lot more with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate your support. And thanks again for having me. So just wanted to say thank you guys all for coming. I do want to point out um, Ruby has gratefully, graciously, um, let us display some of her artwork. So as you are on your way out, you can see some of her paintings right here. Um, and we also have a lot of food left. So if you want to grab something on the way out, please feel free to do so. So thank you, Ruby. Thank you. Thanks again for inviting me. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.